do we really mean that it's okay to not be okay? I'm 55 years old. <clears throat> and I know I look 30, but anyway, just throw that in there, you know. Uh, but I've lived long enough and uh, been a part of church my entire life, uh, born as a pastor's son, and uh, have experienced um, many different scenarios church-wise and, uh, and, and been in environments where you would say that the majority of people there had been in church also most all their lives. When I was young, that was kind of the case. Uh, very, very little uh, brand new life into that because in some ways the boundaries were set up so high it was kind of hard for anybody outside of that to come in because there was so much of an emphasis on pure living, which is a wonderful thing, that, um, that most people couldn't jump the hurdle from all, for, because of all the lifestyle issues that they had to almost address immediately. And, uh, and yet, even in that kind of a system, uh, as I look back across that, even when we were coming through those years, what I realized was, even where it was kind of the holy club, everybody still wasn't okay. And um, if you sit down and have a conversation with somebody long enough or open enough, you'll find out that all of us have had some times in our lives when we haven't been okay. We haven't been okay. And uh, I just want to say, we want this to be a place where it's okay not to be okay. Now, does that mean that we just say, you know, there's no room for, you know, you can't ever hope for improvement. We're not talking about that. We believe there's massive room for improvement. There's massive room for change. There's, it, it's only limited by what you believe God can do in your life. And we continue to witness that kind of life change. But I have to tell you, that if church is a place where people have to be okay before they can come, then um, most people can't come and most people who are going should leave because we're not all okay. Um, I, wanna read, I wanna read a passage of scripture to you and it's on your notes and it's uh, on, the, on the front side of your notes uh, the newest addition to the, in the series of, uh, of scriptures that we've added. And uh, I'm, I may not read the entire thing, but I might try to marathon our way kind of through here. So, uh, and, and when I say that, it's because I, I kind of want you to get the big picture of this, what the scripture is saying. First Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Greg and men's breakfast yesterday, always want to say, guys, if you miss men's breakfast, you miss a great, great food, uh, as long as Marcus isn't cooking. And, uh, it's, it, and, uh, and it, that's by his own admission. I didn't say it. I mean, I said it now, but I mean, I'm just quoting him. Uh, and so I did have to ask the question when I came in yesterday morning, was Mark, because he seemed like he was maybe on the team. I'm going, was Marcus cooking this morning? He said, no, he didn't help. So it was good. Uh, it has to do with eggshells getting places they're not supposed to be. But anyway, um, you know, means well. I know you mean well, Marcus. I know it. Uh, it's a good heart, but it's the kitchen. Uh, Anyway, now, I forget how that ties into what I'm talking about here, but anyway, oh yeah, Greg shared a similar passage yesterday morning uh, from, taken from Romans chapter 12, a very parallel kind of passage, and he wasn't sure if he was getting in my lunch or not, he, was, he knew he wasn't headed in the same direction, but, uh, and so if you were there yesterday, this will sound very familiar to you, but it is a different passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's read it, let's, we're going to kind of roll down through it, you can, you can uh, uh, watch on PowerPoint or you can look at the notes or just open your Bibles to it. This is from the NIV. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit 
so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not be, it would not be for that reason, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, the, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. If that last statement that I read could, could truly be reflected in the church of Jesus Christ, I believe that it would make a bold statement to anybody who doesn't belong. And um, it doesn't always happen that way. I just want to ask you, if you hit your finger with a hammer, what do you do with your finger? Anybody bold enough to say? What is it? <laughs> okay. I was hoping someone would say that. You stick it in your mouth. That's one option. What's another option? What? Baby it. Hold it. You know, you grab it, whatever you hold it up to you. And your voice wails. And your feet dance. And you're not a jo dance of joy either. And, and your whole body kind of scrunches up. And if it's your thumb you hit and you put it in your mouth, please take a picture of it. We want to see that, okay? We want to use that. But, I do, that. but that can happen. We know it does happen. It is a favorite place, but it's still the rest of the body just all of a sudden just stops what it's doing and gathers and holds that. Wouldn't that be a pretty neat picture that if someone in the body was hurting, suffering, that the rest of the body just responded naturally to that. It, it, even if they failed, it, it, you know, I, I have a concern for the, for the Christianity as a whole, for Christianity as a whole, is that it almost seems like people are poised, ready to shoot anything that is injured or damaged within, within the larger body of Christ and, uh, and to accuse and all those kinds of things rather than to come alongside and help. And I just believe this is a beautiful picture of what God wants the body to be. And it's one of those areas where sometimes it's easy to, for it not to function well here. Um, if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. How easy is it for us to applaud other people's victories, other people's wins? It's critically important that we have within us the capacity to rejoice. You know, I, as a pastor, I do not view us as in competition with any other God-honoring church. And if God allows a church to grow 10 times faster than our church grows, or that I should be able to rejoice in that if people are coming to the kingdom of God. And if I can't, then I need to double check something in my own spirit. So it's very important. This is a, to me, it's a, an incredibly important part that I just want to take a moment to emphasize. Let's go on. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. 
God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the, more excellent, the most excellent way, which is the love chapter it goes into there. Now, I want to just make a couple comments about the passage. I'm not doing an exegesis of the passage, and if you don't know what that word means, it's okay. Um, it, it just means I'm not tearing apart piece by piece and, and, and uh, doing major word studies on it and you know, giving you a, 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 an in-depth analysis of it. My opinion is this, is the message of this is pretty straightforward. If you have much of an imagination at all, you can picture how, what's being said here. And that is that each of us have a place in God's kingdom. And that everybody matters. Every piece matters. The parts that, are, that, that, that seem to be uh, more honorable or the parts that are more hidden, every part has, has a place. And every part matters. You know, and, and we just have to think about it in terms of how our body works. You know, we can say all day long, you know, why well, I, I don't, you know, I mean, I don't even think about my toes. Well, why don't you just chop a couple of them off and see about how much you think about them, you know, and, and how much they help you every day of your lives. Um, you know, we don't think much about our ears and, and you know, and, and, you know, unless you're a woman that has a lot of, or somebody has a lot of earrings in it, maybe, or something like that, you know, but, but. Uh, but typically speaking, you know, I don't go around in the day thinking about my ears. You know, I don't think much about them. But I sure do appreciate the fact that they're there and they work for the most part. I am losing a little bit of hearing there. So, uh, Pat, I need to learn how to do sign language, don't I? You know, but I will have to tell you, the sign he was giving me was this, like that. I did not know what to, I thought I was supposed to do a fast pitch or something. So it was my fault, though, Pat. It was my fault. I will, I will admit it, my fault. But anyway... But I, uh, we got to get the sign language thing down a little bit better, you know. He's a baseball coach, so he knows all these signs. I know none of them. I, never, I, I played baseball only in, you know, in, in pickup games. So um, anyway, we'll get we'll get that we'll get that down. It's always my fault. That, just remember that if the sound isn't right, it's always and I'm involved. It's always my fault. I don't think it's ever been the other way. So you can just say to your neighbor right there, it's always Rod's fault. Um, never Pat's and uh, the other guys. So anyway. So the deal is that if we understand and know this about our body, we, we, it should not be too hard for us to imagine that God puts together the body of Christ in a similar way and that every part, part matters. Every part has a part to play. And so what I'd like to do is, um, is talk to you just a little bit about, I'm going to finish up what I was sharing last week, but I'm going to finish it up in the context of, uh, of, of talking about what the call looks like in community and then what the call looks like individually. And uh, we'll, I believe we can get these done today. Um, and so what the call looks like, in other words, we've talked about our call. We, our, our actual mission statement is that it's our desire to reach spiritually unresolved people, which is part A. Part B is, and help them become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and so we want to talk about that, that first piece in particular as it relates to how we work together in community. Um, and and I'm, going to, I'm going to emphasize that part of it in the community side. Uh, certainly there's a community side that works in, in, in the back side of that as well, uh, such as in our small groups, such as even what happens here on Sunday morning within our teaching time, our worship time, and uh, in a variety of other ministries. But um, I don't have time to, to work all of the angles of that, so I'm going to work on the, on the front side of that because I think that the front side is what has a tendency to slip away from us if we're not careful. And we'll talk about the back side on the individual. We'll emphasize the back side of the vision or the mission uh, on the individual side. And so in community, uh, what the call looks like in community. I, I don't believe there are many jobs. There are jobs where... It's best done by a single person. Uh, but there are very few jobs that involve only one person, where the whole thing involves only one person. Most jobs have an interconnectedness to it. There's a connection 
to other people, other systems, other, it's a, either a team effort or it's, it's a, there, there's, there's this sense of connectedness with other entities. And so we, we, we know life operates that way. You know, if you go to a grocery store, uh, you know, depending on what kind of it's a high discount, you might be high on self-serve. But if it's one that, that, that emphasizes uh, customer service, then, uh, there's, then you'll find that all through the store, wherever you are, people will ask, can I help you find something? They'll interact with you along that way. They seem glad that you came up to the counter and would you know, get something from the, uh, from the, from the meat counter or from, the, uh, or from the vegetables or that kind of thing. They, they seem eager, eager to help. Uh, and they're friendly when you check out. Uh, I'm still of the mindset that I, I don't like self-checkouts. Um, and especially uh, in Kroger over here. And I, I just pick on them because that's the one I've, you know, kind of quick, easy, sometimes close by. It's telling me to do things that I, and it's telling me to do it in a way that I can't keep up or I'm getting ahead of it or something. You know, it says, place the item in the bag. Okay. I put it in the bag, but I didn't put it in in time. So it, then it tells the guy up there I'm trying to steal something. And he comes back and goes, hey, uh, you know, what, uh, you just need to put it in the bag. I tried to put it in the bag. Anyway, it's, it really doesn't work out real well for me. So even if I'm in late and it's self-serve and I only have three items, I go, could we just open up the nearest? Like, can we do it over here? I really don't like these things. And, um, and so, but, but, but what we know is it takes all kinds of people to make something like that work. If you have people in the different places, you can go, you can go to a hospital, you can go, you know, go to a factory, uh, you can go to a car dealership. You have all these different people who are doing different things. And they all, they all what they're doing matters, and, and it helps make the whole thing work. The church, God designed the church that way. And, 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 and the, it, it can't be done by one person. In fact, uh, Whenever it comes to, you know, I, I did a lot of kind of evangelism training when I was in school, and, um, and, and I mentioned earlier in the series that I took it very personally that it was my job to evangelize the world, and I was pretty certain that without me, God would fail at his mission. You know, I mean, it was like, I, this was really, really critical, and, and when I say that, I don't make light of the fact that God does use us, but what I was saying, what I felt like maybe was happening for me was, I was taking on a bigger piece of the responsibility than God had actually given me. And so I felt like it was up to me to, 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 to pray for this person standing right there, to witness to them, to watch them and pray with them to cross the line of faith into a personal relationship with Jesus, and then to disciple them, and then to make sure that they were a very healthy believer. That was all my job. The problem is it, life doesn't really happen that way. Because of the encounters and things that we have, it doesn't happen that way. And Paul himself said in Corinthians again, and this isn't going to be in your notes, you may want to jot it down, but in chapter 3 he says this, and this is a very key component to what, what I'm going to talk about in, in, in how we function as a church. He says, brothers, and this is chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, uh, I, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly. Mere infants in Christ, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you were, st you were still not ready. In other words, you're still immature. You're still worldly. For, for there is jealousy, since there's jealousy and quarreling among you. Are you not worldly? In other words, you're acting just like everybody else. You're not acting like the children of God. Are you, are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who pardon me, plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. We, you are God's field, God's building. Now, Again, that's a really awesome passage of Scripture, but the point that I want to take from that passage this morning is this, and that is, Paul, the greatest evangelist that has ever lived, and yes, I mean greater than Billy Graham and anyone else you can think of, Dwight L. Moody, all of them, this is the greatest evangelist that has ever lived. He was an apostle, and he said, it's not all up to me. I can't do it all. I can't do it by myself. 
In fact, what I can do is I can plant some seeds and then someone like Apollos and later he mentions Peter and uh, different ones come along and they water and various other people. But God's the one who has to make the increase. See, I, I used to think it was my job for that increase to happen. And that's where I really had to learn some hard lessons because, and as I've mentioned many times, especially in this series right here, I resigned trying to be the Holy Spirit. I, 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 I remember a time period where I literally resigned. Now, I didn't have the job. It had never been given to me. But I had taken it like it was my job. And so I needed to resign. God never gave it to me, and he didn't think I was the Holy Spirit. Don't worry. He wasn't confused. Rod was confused. And so I had to resign from that and understand I have a role to play, and it's a critical role. And my role as a pastor is to get others engaged in playing their role. And in doing so, we will see that we create environments and places where people can come to faith. God's the one who makes that happen in their lives, but we can create environments for that to occur. So in understanding that, it began to deeply affect how I envisioned that God would have us go about reaching people who were lost. As Jesus said, he came to seek and to save. One of the verses on your sheet, uh, save the lost. And so if that's our mission, our job, then how are we going to go about it? Well, let's talk about it in community. We kind of talked the other week about, last week, about the fact that most people, when they get to the point of trying church, as many times they will talk to individuals, they'll interact with somebody about their journey, they're seeking out of, of understanding God or faith, and uh, they'll turn to someone they trust, because unfortunately, um, many people in our culture today do not trust churches or religious organizations uh, very much, in particular if they've been away from them for a while. And many of them for good reasons. Um, there, there has certainly been a lot of behaviors and practices that have not been God-honoring in the name of God. And so there's a cynicism and a distrust for that. So oftentimes people will begin with people they trust. And then out of that, through that person, may end up coming to a, a point of visiting a church. And so then we'd like, okay, what happens when they do that and how do we go about it? So let me just talk on a practical level of some things that we try to do here. And, we, and many of you are already involved in these things. And some of you may not be involved in these, but you're involved in some of the other kinds of ministries that we do. And, 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 I, and I'm going to offer something for everybody, whether you're involved in any of those or not. Um, really on a Sunday morning, because we feel like that's the time when most people who have not been in church for a while, will visit for the first time. If you're one of those persons here this morning, I'm, I'm telling you why we do what we do, and, and hopefully you understand and appreciate that. Uh, if, you're, if you're a regular here or newer, it would just maybe help clarify if there's any questions at all. Um, Sunday morning is a time, let me just say this, 85 to 95% of what I teach on Sunday morning is for believers. I, I'm, I'm really not teaching to lost people, except in this sense, that I teach in a practical kind of way that hopefully they're, they, don't, they can understand what we're talking about. In other words, I'm not using such churchified terms that they have no clue. We're not just using inside language. We're using common, everyday language so that a person who has is, who is maybe been away from church for a while or maybe they left because they didn't think it was relevant to their lives, begins to see that God's word makes sense about everything, everyday life. And so, so we've chosen Sunday morning as a place where we want to create an environment if someone did come and they do come that is, uh, has been disenfranchised from God and church for a while, that they, would feel, that they would feel welcome and comfortable. And so because of that, um, really, we, we start the service at 10 o'clock. But things begin to happen around here about 7 o'clock on Sunday morning. And on typically, typically speaking, the staff may show up first. Uh, sometimes there are others who may, may be here at the same time or whatever or very soon thereafter. Uh, then typically the uh, breakfast crew shows up, and we have four different teams who do pastor's breakfast. And, uh, and they all of a sudden somewhere along the morning you start smelling uh, some food being cooked, and you start having these, you know, like, man, that's a, this is, wow, this is great. I'm glad I came to church this morning kind of feeling. And, um, and 
And the reason they're doing the breakfast is, uh, is for someone who's newer to the church to have a chance to be able to, for me to be able to sit down with them and interact about who they are and who we are. In just a brief sense, um, it allows me uh, to get to know people by name, allows me to get to know a little bit about their life and, and then be able to... And so, so when people come on a Sunday morning, uh, breakfast is always ready. And, and you know, we, we don't ask people on the very first Sunday to come because they don't come early for it, but then thereafter uh, to come and participate. So the breakfast crew shows up and that's, those are four different teams. And uh, to my knowledge, we've, uh, we, we have had two teams show up at one time once or twice, but we've never had nobody show for that. Those people are... Anyway, they're amazing people, and they're super dedicated and committed and just uh, make that happen. And if we happen, you know, not to have, which, you know, maybe about 50% of the time, or, or it depends on what season it is, uh, don't have somebody for the pastor's breakfast, then if you're here early enough, you get to eat some. If you come right at time, it may be gone. You know, right at time of church, it may be gone, except for the things nobody else wanted over there, you know, or whatever, and then you can have that. Um, I, I don't know what that would be because it's always good. The band begins to show up. And the band comes in and they uh, get up here and, you know, and have to, you know, musicians are funny people. And I, and I can say that because I'm married to a musician. They're funny people. And BG is a pretty balanced musician. But they, um, they're, they can be, they, they, they're, because they're gifted, high gifted people, stuff like that. They're like, um, they're, they're, what's that? They're artsy, yes, they're artsy, but they're also they have mood swings sometimes, you know. Something. So they have to have they have to have the practice just to get all their moods and everything like in the right place, you know. Yeah, they got the music, get the moods, get all. You know, it does really, really quite good. But you know, th sometimes they they have to argue like brothers and sisters a little bit to kind of get and like they just you know they're anyway they're smart people. They're really amazing, and I, and I, and I love musicians. Um, I'm in enough so that I married one, but, uh, but, but so they come in and they process through what they need to get processed through, uh, to be ready. And there have been, you know, I think there've probably been sometimes they're going like, man, I don't, I'm not sure we're ready for this. And then they come together and they, and they're able to make it happen. And so, uh, and so the band, the band comes, they, they, they do a practice during the week as well as, uh, as a practice on, um, on, on Sunday mornings. And so, just a whole lot of commitment to, to make that happen. Uh, then the tech team sometimes comes in the same time they do or along that time. And uh, I know I've been picking on Pat this morning. I'm, you know, I, I'm not picking on him. It was just, every, it's all my fault. Just say to somebody again, it's all Rod's fault. Anyway, you, can, you don't have to, but you can. Um, and then the greeters uh, show up somewhere in there. And, uh, in the, in the, and, then, uh, and then also... Uh, we have a guest sanctuary where people can get a gift, or, or then we have children's ministry people start showing up, start coming in and uh, getting themselves ready for, for what's going to happen there. Nursery workers start coming in. And then on the other side, when it's all over, there's a growth track team that hangs out, and they, uh, they either do the, they do the preparation for the, for the lunch, and then they do, uh, then one, someone does the class, either me or one of the other guys. And so, um, and so just on a Sunday morning from about 7 to 1.30 or 2.00, there's a lot going on that isn't necessarily visible to what happens in the service. The reason those things are going on is for preparation for what we want to make available to people who might come and be a part of this. And so, uh, and, and, and so it takes a lot of people, a lot of people. And, uh, and, and then, of course, there's another whole aspect of the backside of that, small groups and a variety of other ministries that, uh, that, that celebrate recovery and that kind of thing that are, that are well beyond all this, that have people involved, engaged in those things. But here's what I want to here's, here's, here's say to you. It's not, you know, my role as a teacher or a preacher is, is to feed the flock and to challenge those who do not have not experienced faith, to come to that point of believing in faith. But if, but if it's up to me alone, we're in trouble. And I'm in trouble. It takes a concerted effort. And sometimes you might think, well, I do this little piece over there. What does that have to do with someone coming to faith? It has everything to do with someone coming to faith. Because if that's not available to them, then as a result, there, there's going to be something missing. Or, or there could be a, a, a kind of a... Um, I guess, a, a piece of what needs to happen that doesn't happen. 
And so now this is where I'm going to bring it down to every person here, whether you're on one of those teams or another team or you're not on any team whatsoever, um, then I'm going to, I'm going to, here's how I'm going to enlist you on a Sunday morning for, uh, for, the, for the grand purpose of what we're doing. What I've come to see over the last 17 and a half years is hundreds of people, several hundred people who have come to personal faith in Jesus Christ. We have literally probably now over a thousand people who have called this their church home that are spread out around the country and around the world uh, beyond what the congregation is right here today. And who are, in many of those cases, still living out their faith diligently and engaged in a local body of Christ wherever they are. And, uh, and many of them actually involved directly in doing some ministries within those churches. And so, so what I have seen in contrast to some of my previous years where it was a little bit more of what we would call ministering to the church itself, which was fine. And yes, new people coming in, but, uh, but not the same kind of impact because... We weren't as prepared, really, to manage or to deal with or to handle those who might come through the doors. And, uh, and so here's, here's what I'm going to ask you. If you've been to church here twice or three times or more, and in, in, in your mind you kind of consider this church home to you, uh, there's, there's, there are four things that you can do on any given Sunday morning that would help the other things that are going on. Number one, you could say a prayer. If you're a believer, if you're, you know, if you're here and you're not a believer, uh, we're super glad you're here. And so I'm not going to ask you to do this one except say a prayer for yourself. But if you're a believer and you're here, you can say a prayer for anyone that God would entrust to us on this given Sunday morning. That, that, that they're, they're, uh, they're seeking to know about God. They're, they're, there may be in a struggle in their life that God would minister to them, that we, they would be able to receive something of benefit spiritually and emotionally and practically in their lives by being here on this day. So say a prayer. It can be all of 30 seconds. But for if, if everyone would say a prayer, either before you get here, on your way here, or once you get here, um, that, would, that would just really make a big difference. Um, to say a prayer for anybody who needs to be ministered to in a specific way. So that's one thing. If you want to write that down, you can. If you think you can remember it, that's great. But, uh, but I may suggest writing it down. That's something everyone, everyone can do. The second thing is this. Now, this is really, really tough. And so I'm kind of hesitant to ask you to do this. But maybe you could smile. You know... I don't care whether you like Joel Steen or not. That boy knows how to smile. I, I, I don't know how he smiles so long and so, you know, and every, but that guy can smile. I, sometimes I think people go to his church just to watch him smile. They didn't see anybody smile in a while. You know, they're like, man, one thing I do know for sure is Joel's going to be smiling this morning or he's going to be smiling that TV. Um, I know life's tough. I mean, I, I know it's rough. I know it's hard, but it's amazing what a smile will do. And so, I, you know, if, if you've got a lot on your mind, still come to church, please, because this is a good dumping station. You know, this is, and I would say this, if you're going through something really tough, you don't have to smile. You know, it's okay not to be okay. So, you, I mean, you can even come in grouchy. We'll take you grouchy. You know, we're, we're fine with that, too. Um, but, but if possible, smile. You can see that's going over like a lead balloon. No one smile at me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the next thing is speak. Hey, it's good to see you today. You say, well, I don't know their name. You still say it's good to see them. I say, I say nice things to people all day long, you know, wherever I am or whatever. I may never know their name, but, um, but you can still say something nice. It's good to see you today. Um, welcome to Westtown. Yeah, but I'm new. Maybe they've been here like 10 years. It's okay. I still think they'd like to be. Well, I, I've been here 17 and a half years. I'd still like for someone to come up and say, welcome to Westtown, Rod. Like, or you don't have to say my name, you know. I, I'm, I would be glad to know you're glad I'm here. Um, 
So, you know, to say, you know, you don't, have, you don't have to know people's names to say something nice to them. It's a beautiful day to be in worship. You know, Saad, I love, I, I started saying happy Sunday because he walked up to me one Sunday morning and said, in his God-sounding voice. If you haven't heard it, he and Bill Rabb, man, we have two God voices around here. So if you ever hear, if you hear, you feel like God spoke to you, it's probably Bill Rabb or Saad standing near you someplace and your ground shakes and they go, he said, happy Sunday. <laughs> big, old, big old hand. And I just, I, I can't get away from that statement. It's like, man, why wouldn't Sunday of all days be happy, a happy Sunday? So thanks, Odd. That, I like that very much so. So you can walk up to somebody and say, happy Sunday. And uh, if they look at you funny, say, Rod told me to say that. Anyway, you just, you know, but I, I'm, I'm serious. You could say something. You could even share your name. You know, you don't have to say, is this your first Sunday here today? You know, that, that, and they say, well, actually, I've been here for about, you know, six years. Uh, then, that, you know, that feels odd. So what, what, what you can say to something like this, say, I don't think I've had a chance to, you know, get your name, but my name's Rod. Yeah, but I don't know what, I don't know if who they're related to in the church or who, I don't know if who they know or who I, I don't know if I'm allowed to speak, you know, baloney. If we have, if we ever go down that road, I'm, I'm busting it up. I'm sorry. You know, I mean, we can't, that's not, that's, this isn't club related. There's, there's, no, there's no specialty group. There's no, uh, there's no special interest group. We're the body of Christ. And we think toes are important. So if you're a toe, man, we think you're very, very important. And, you know, sometimes I'll say in serving uh, areas when we're interviewing is this, you know, we think every job matters. And if you don't think they do, then we could just let the toilets go for about three or four weeks and you could come in and you can see whether you think that matters or not, whether that's important, okay? Um, so it takes everybody participating. You know, we just had a couple of people publicly share uh, some words and uh, Shelly's not in here this morning, but Shelly, if you remember recently, she and her husband and little boy came up and she kind of spoke to the church from a standpoint of uh, almost like uh, a letter, letter like the Apostle Paul, giving thanks to you for, and she was talking about their infertility and this, and they've gone through some uh, challenges in their family, and the church did this, and she went down through a whole list of things that they experienced, and the church responded in this way, very reflective of what this passage about the body of Christ uh, is about. And what, what struck me the most in that reading, that sharing that she gave, was this. She actually was bold enough to go ahead and name some names. And I, I didn't go back and count the names, but there had to have been at least a dozen or more names attached specifically to many of the things that she needed and that people responded. Now, I'm sure there were more than that, but those were ones specifically that she went ahead and stated. This past Thursday night, Marcus gave his testimony here in Celebrate Recovery, and I just have to tell you, if you missed it, you missed a kind of wide open sharing from his heart testimony. And again, Marcus came to the church here with some struggles. Um, I'm not going to give his testimony for him, but some serious struggles, some very significant, some life altering kind of struggles. Things were going to go down a path of destruction if something didn't happen. And fortunately, through a whole series of events and people and situations and everything else and uh, everything from the band embracing him, uh, Celebrate Recovery, different individuals, whatever. But he listed off a name of individuals and spoke directly to those individuals. His entire small group was here that night. That many of them are not participants in Celebrate Recovery. His entire 30-something small group was here to support him. Uh, a list again about a dozen people did a list off and I was sitting there and I was thinking that's what we're talking about here you bring a friend with you who may need to be strengthened spiritually or to grow in their faith or to become a believer and you know what might happen you might not ultimately be the person who really leads them through all the steps that need to happen in their lives for them to become a stable believer, for them to become that fully devoted follower of Christ. You, you pro in fact, 
I can go ahead and promise you, you won't be. You may do two or three of the steps. You may be a part, you may be a part of the whole thing, but there's going to be other people who are going to plant seeds and are going to water along the way. And that has to be, you know, Marcus, I was thinking, I have his permission to be talking about this. I was thinking as he was sharing, there were some of the things that Marcus was addressing and dealing with in his life that honestly I wouldn't have been able to help him. There were some of, some of the things that he was, uh, he was addressing and dealing with that were, there were other people who were able to connect with him in such a variety of ways. And so as he kind of walked through that list of about 12 people, I'm just thinking, that's what the body of Christ is about. And when I've seen that happen over and over and over and over again, I know I have a front row seat. I know I tend to know things. Sometimes other people don't know. I tend to see things. But what I've, what I've witnessed over the years, I mean, even back at our very earliest, and I've mentioned Janin before, uh, Janin Van Fossen, who was, a, who was a skeptic when he came to Westtown, a, a deep skeptic. And, um, and, and, you know, probably leaned toward atheism, but was not, not vowing that. And, uh, and I, I had an intense journey with him for about an 18-month period after West Town started. And I, I was there when he crossed the line of faith. We were sitting in my, we made an appointment. We were sitting in my office. We were there. And every time I ever heard Janet tell his testimony, he never mentioned me. He mentioned the lady's Bible study that prayed for him. He mentioned this person, the other. And I'm thinking, but Janin, I was there too. I know I helped. I, I, didn't I have some part to do with this? And like, you know, God would go, shut up, sit down. This isn't about you. You know, and I'm like, I, I mean, I remember precisely standing on the sidewalk out. We were doing a project together for the church, and we were standing down someplace outside some music store. And I just said, Janin, where are you on your spiritual journey? And he goes, well, this is like 18 months in, you know. He goes, I'm kind of like sitting on the fence about ready to fall in. And I said, I said to him, do you mind if I push you? He goes, nope. I said, well, I want my wife there. Let's do it Sunday morning after church. And so anyway, I, you know, I'm cool with that. I know I went ahead. Don't worry. I, whatever glory I could have gotten, it's all gone. Whenever we get to heaven, my name won't be mentioned with Janet either because I already mentioned it here, okay? I'm going ahead and put myself in there going, I did have a part of that. I know I did, you know? But the, see, the deal is it doesn't matter. And that's what Paul's saying to the Corinthians. It doesn't matter if you go, well, I got saved under the great ministry of the Apostle Paul. Yeah, but I got saved under the order Apollos. And oh, but Peter, he's boy, he's a lot more fiery than those guys. Those guys are like you know, like teachers. He's a preacher. He says it like it is. You know, I got saved under him. And he, he compared all this, and, he, and Paul's going silliness. We're all in this together. See, we're a team. We're, not, we're, we're you don't just we're not just coming to church on Sunday morning to worship and to sing songs and to hear something to challenge us. We're coming to work together to build the kingdom, to grow the kingdom. And, and so it's critical for all hands to be on deck. Even if the simple, some simple part that you play is saying a prayer, smiling, speaking, or sharing. Just a few words with somebody. Now, I'm going to flip over here to the um, individual side in just a moment. But I want to just go through a few a list of things that I have down here that have to do with kind of what we desire to see happen. I'm not saying we hit it right every time, but this is what we desire to see happen when we're in the moment like we are right here today. A couple of them I may have shared, but I just want to, I'm going to start, start where um, at this point and move my way through. So if a couple of them you heard, uh, just bear with me on that. Messages of truth with reason. In other words, we can say, this, thus saith the Lord. But we believe there's always a good reason why God says that. As much as possible, we want, to, we want to give the reason. Sometimes we don't know. But as much as we can discern, we want to be able to say, guess what? This is why we think God would say this to us. So message of truth with reason. Truth with compassion. In other words, we want to speak the truth, but not use it as a weapon to beat people up but as, a, as, as a something to, to shed the light and go, living in darkness will bring destruction and havoc in your life. Look, 
Look what the truth does. It puts you in light. It gives you freedom. It sets you free. It gives you a chance to follow in a way that is livable. You can die with this kind of faith. Also, primarily what God is for. In the Garden of Eden, um, you know, there, there, there's all, all the stuff there. How many trees did God say don't eat of? One. So when people tell me, well, God's just negative. He's against everything. I'm going, did you, did you happen to read how many things he was against like when he put Adam and Eve in the garden? See, that really is reflective of how God interacts with us. He's, he's not against. Yeah, certainly there's some things he's saying don't do, but the only reason he's saying don't do that is like, it is for your good. It's like you telling your kid, don't play in the street, you know? I have a weird sense of humor sometimes, and I know you guys already know that, and uh, can't tell jokes very well, so I just use it out and try to do funny other ways. But, um, so, so, so sometimes when I'm telling the kids not to do something, I will say something that kind of catches their attention. Like, I don't want Hunter to, to ride his bike in the street because there's maybe traffic. Everybody's coming home right now from, from work. And so I'll say, listen, Hunter, I want you to, I want you to see how many cars you can run over now, okay, with your bike. He's like, what? You know, like, what? But at least I got his attention. Then I can tell him, there's a lot of cars going through right now. I don't want you riding your bike. You know, that can, but it's like, so, I, so, so anyway, um, God is for much more than he's against. And if he's against something, it's for your good. He's basically telling you what you tell your kid. Don't, don't. Don't try to play bumper cars with your bike and cars, okay? Um, invitations to grow. So I think God's all about growth. So we want to be a place where we're saying, come on and grow. Come on, go with us, grow. Layman's language that leads. You won't hear a lot of theological pie in the sky. And I'm, I, you know, I don't, I don't really apologize for it, but, I, but I'm, I'm just simply say there's a reason why that's the case. Um, you know, it isn't because uh, we don't know that language. It's because the average person doesn't speak that language. Uh, motivated by love. And uh, I want to say, you know, at the bottom of your outline, at the back side, what you'll see is there are two motivations that we have for us doing church the way we do it. And if it ever changes, then we're in trouble. And that is love, love for God and love for people. And that's the only way we can love people is love God. Because otherwise, when I stop loving God the way I need to love him, people start really getting on my nerves. I'm, I'm just being honest, you know. I see everything wrong with everybody, everything. You know, if I, stop, if I stop loving God the right way, people just look like a problem. But when I'm loving God, it's easy to love people. And the other is life change. What motivates us? What is our motivation to see people's lives changed? And I would just have to tell you, there is not time to tell, we could go on and do a whole series on just the life change that we've been able to witness and see in people's lives. I remember one time we had a couple that came through that were kind of what I would call on the fringe side of charismatic. Uh, they weren't just like regular. For some reason they hung out with us about a year and a half. And I think, it, I think it's because they felt loved here. Because I think sometimes they didn't even always feel loved in charismatic circles because they were way off the edge. But they were really wanted to see people raised from the dead. I mean, it's just like a passion. Like, we are not seeing people raised from the dead. And, you know, and I'm getting a big email. I think, Billy, you got some of the emails and a few other people got, you know, like, this is a problem. We're not seeing people raised from the dead. And I, I don't respond big things like that email. So, but when I had a chance to sit down and talk, I said, man, I don't know what you're missing, but I'm like seeing people raised from the dead. You want me to go introduce you to some of them? And, uh, and so, you know, and she wasn't trying to cause a problem. She wasn't, they were never problems to us. But, but it was just like, she's like, until she saw someone physically raised, I'm thinking if, you, if we raised somebody from the dead and they were in heaven, you know the first thing they would do is slap us right in the face and go, don't ever do that again. I'm okay. Leave me alone. I would, I would say, this is a whole lot better deal than what you guys have. You just don't know it. So, you know, so, so we, you know, our, our perspective sometimes is just, you know, so is, is, is crazy. But our motivation is to see people's lives change. A faith in what God has done and can do. 
Not what he's not doing, but what he has done, he's able to do. A sense of helpfulness that leads to hope in Christ. Do you know that Jesus, most of the time when someone walked up to him, one of the things that would come out of his mouth is read the Gospels for yourself. He said, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? What if at church, when people walk in, we just said, and we never knew him from Adam or anything else, they walk in, we go, well, what can we do for you? What do you do for me? I just came to sit in the back row. I'm not, you know, I mean, like, I never knew churches would do something for you. I thought you wanted my offering. Uh, I, th- I, th- I thought you wanted to make me clean the toilet, so I didn't know you wanted to help me. Um, isn't that crazy? Jesus said, man, what can I do for you? Awesome. I think it's pretty awesome. Um, number 13, or, but it's not number 13 for you, it's for me. Okay, you don't, you don't have these listed here. Um, <laughs> I apologize. I tell you, today's been a ride, hasn't it? Um, I've enjoyed it. I hope you are. Believers with God's vision for the world. In other words, we're saying, we're not doing this because just Greg and I ate too much pizza one night and sat down and said, hey, let's just do something crazy for God. We, 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 we really tried to understand what does God want to do and who does he want us to go after and endeavor to do that. Certainly, I know we fall far short, but I, I have to tell you, we, we, are, we are trying. Number, well, anyway, forget the numbers. People in process with their flaws, failures, fears, and hopes. In other words, we, you know, you might be here today, you might be here three years from now, and you might be here, you might be back here, you know, five years from now, but you're going to, the point is, you're all, we want people to be headed toward healing, toward hope. A place where their God-given right to choose is respected while challenged. And that's something, if you noticed about doubts on the video we showed, it's okay to come here with doubts. It's okay to come here with disbelief. It's, we, we hope people will come here with disbelief. We hope people will come here who, who don't even think God exists. We hope atheists will show up here. We want, we, we want to engage that. Not from an argumentative standpoint, but from, an, but from, from I think if they see the community of God be the community of God, there comes a point where God becomes real. There's a gentleman in our church, um, and uh, he actually gave me, per- I, I got permission to tell the story. I'm going to close with this story. So we'll do the individual one next week. We'll get, we'll get done with this, I promise you, uh, someday. But here's, he, he, and so I got his permission because he came to me uh, back a few months ago, and he said, uh, I need to talk to you one-on-one. And so we sat down, and he basically said, I don't really know if I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit here very well. And uh, I said, why? He said, well, I think I'm kind of liberal. I said, well, what do you mean by liberal? And uh, he said, "Um, I I mean, like, maybe theologically or whatever he goes, I don't know. You know, over the course of conversation, bottom line is this. Here's what it came down to. Uh, There's a lot of things. He's accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. But there's a lot of things about the Bible he still doesn't understand and not so sure about, has some questions about. The gospel story he feels solid about. But he's been steeped in evolution for, his, for years, and he's a real smart guy. And so the creation story just is like, wow, you know. So what we've done, we've engaged various times where we sit down and we have not arguments, we have discussions about what might be true or what might not be true. And he talks from his evolutionary standpoint and my, from, from the Bible. And, uh, and again, we're not, we're not, we don't have a deadline on this and we don't have anything like, well, let me just tell you this, sir. If in three months from now you're not an avowed creationist, you're out. We're not doing that. So what, what I let him know and understand was this. This is a very safe place to explore your faith. And, and there, may be, there may be others who are on your same journey, but here's, here's, here's the core issue. The core issue is this. I don't want people to say they believe something they don't believe just to fit in. All we've done then is just created a mass uh, you know, false society is basically what we've done. So we want it to be a place where people can be 
very open and honest. I've, I've had many people, many people over the years, you know, ask lots of questions, good questions about the Bible, about the Trinity, about the deity of Christ, all those factors. And here's what I want to tell you. We're here to help people on the journey toward God and to come to a personal relationship with God. We're not here to cookie cut people out. Do, do, I, do I have a goal in my meeting with, with this now friend of mine? Absolutely, you know. I'm hoping someday he'll be an avowed creationist. You know, that's what I hope. But, that's, but the fact is this, that I'm learning a lot in the process, and I believe he's learning a lot, and we're growing, and he's growing, I'm growing, we're growing together. And I'm going to challenge his view, but I'm going to show him personal respect for where he is. And the last one is this, a place where love is the rule. If we don't love people and love God, we don't have any business being in the people business. We don't have any business being in the kingdom of God business. Because that's what Jesus said that he's all about. 